God bless you and good morning. Let's turn to the, the book of Job again, and, and let's just read our scripture from verse 20 to 22. Lord God, we're so grateful to be able to gather around your word this morning. And I, I pray, Lord, that these words, Lord, will be helpful to, to, as, we, as we study these things out, Lord. Help us, Lord, as we navigate these scriptures, Lord God, to guide us through them, Lord Jesus, and quicken them to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'll prepare our hearts for what's in store for us today, Lord God, as we meditate upon your words. Grant it, Lord, that you'll be with us now, we pray in your name. <clears throat> so we've been studying, started studying the book of Job, the most depressing book in the Bible. And it's funny how the, the most depressing book maybe can give you encouragement in time of trouble. And, um, uh, you know, the, the reason um, I think why this book is so helpful is because it frames our thinking up in the way, you know, we, we wonder why things are the way they are and uh, are the things that I'm going through, are they normal? And this book kind of uh, helps us to understand that when we're going through rough times, it is normal. It's normal. It's part of it's part of life. It's suffering and trials and things and and uh, and a lot of times God will allow things to happen to us so that we can He can see our reaction and so we can see our reaction. And look at Job's reaction here in verse twenty, where it says, "Then Job arose after all these things befell him." And chapter one, then Job arose and rent his mantle. And shaved his head <coughs> and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the Lord and all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly now what a what a reaction there you can see uh, a lot of strange things happening here in his reaction. He's, of course, he's gr he grievous. He's grieving, and uh, after all the things that befell him, you'd, that's that's a totally normal reaction. And then he worshipped God, which is a strange reaction, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But um, <clears throat> he he said, basically, what he's saying here is that everything I got, God gave me. God gave it to me. It's his right to take it away. Now, that's framing up the, a, a mature reaction to things that happen in your life. It's, it's God. No matter what, what happens to me, I'm trusting God regardless. The Lord gave me everything that I've got. It's, it's he, he's the one that gave it to me. And if he takes it away from me, then blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Now, think about that kind of reaction. Something horrible like that befell him. Uh, I, I was I was talking to my wife the other day. You think if God took away one of your children, that would be devastating, but He'd take away all of His children. Mm -hmm. If God took away your livelihood, that'd be devastating. If He took away all of His camels, all of His uh, I, I, everything, everything was gone, right. and He still in that moment could say, "The Lord gave, the Lord can take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord." Amen. And all this Job said not, nor charged God foolishly. <clears throat> so the book of Job, what it's doing is framing up our understanding of how God runs the world. And as we'll, we'll later on, we'll get into the, all his friends coming and telling him their, their different perspectives, which were all wrong. And, and that's how we, we look at things that are happening in our life. And we've got our own perspective of things, how, how things really are. And, it, and many times it's wrong. So Job is helping us to frame it up so that we look at things the right way. And at, at the end, you'll see what God, God's telling Job, or, do, do you know how the world was framed up? Do you know how the stars? Like we, we come with our little puny conception of how things really are. And there's a greater purpose and a greater understanding. If we could really see things from the way God's looking at it, we'd look at things different. So that's what Job is trying to frame. It help us to understand why things are the way they are and one one thing that we can look at is in job chapter 14 that i read last sunday a man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble so life that means life is full of suffering what can we get out of that scripture <clears throat> that life because life is full of suffering suffering does not automatically mean that you are not a christian 
or that you are a secret sinner or something. I said, that's what Job's, all of his friends were. They just leap to the conclusion that you're, you're going through a bad spot in life. There must be something wrong in your life. And Job kept going back. I, I've done everything right. I've done, I've done everything that I know that I can do. So it, it normalizes suffering. This, this, this perspective normalizes. You're going through a rough time. It, 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 you know, somebody loses their job or uh, you know, loses a loved one. Or so. These are things that are normal to happen. And, and like Psalm chapter 90, David, David tells us, the days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. And you look back; many of us look back on all of our lives, all of our years, and it's a lot. There's a lot of sorrow and sadness, and a lot of things. But what we're in this sin condition, and 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 that's that's part of life. That there's a lot of a lot of bad things. There's a lot of good things, but there's a lot of bad too. Ecclesiastes, as Solomon said, for what hath man of all his labor? and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun. For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. The Solomon, the wisest man on earth, say, his heart taketh not rest in the night. In Psalm 39, David said, Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth. And mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Amen. In Psalm 103, David said, As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. <clears throat> That's a sad thought, and I, I look. I watched my neighbor. He he labored. He built this this big uh, workshop and all these kind of things, and then then uh, the bank foreclosed on him, took it all away, and somebody else moved in, and and uh, now they own that property. And all that labor, uh, it, it's that's uh, sorrowful to think about. I, I, I watched my my uh, my grandparents when before they died, they they labored and built this nice house and and had a beautiful garden and a spring in the backyard and all of these kind of things. And then then they died and somebody else moved in and and just trashed the place. And and it, that's sorrowful. Well, it, here we have no continuing city. We're not living for this life. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. So we're looking for the end. The end of the story is Christ. This is not where we're building up our treasures, but we're storing up our treasures in heaven. That's, that's where our heart is, right? And, and you think, Job, why, why would all these things happen to Job? Job, the, the frame of this story, Job was doing everything right. He was righteous. And that means he was matching up, his life was matching up with the standard that God had laid out for him. He was doing everything right. So in Job 1.1, 1, 1, it says, there was a man in the land of Uz, Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, perfect means he was, he was blameless or he, he had integrity. He was, he was living right. He was doing right. He was walking right. Everything, uh, he, he was trying to dot every I and cross every T and just live, live life. Anytime you make a mistake, go offer the sacrifice. And, and it says he was upright. So that means he was living a just and honest life. Now, the reason the Bible belabors this point is because you, you contrast that with all these things happening to him. Well, there's got to be a reason why. And it wasn't because he was doing something wrong. It says that he feared God. He had reverence and respect for God. He eschewed evil. He was constantly turning away from him and avoiding evil. Now, Ezekiel spoke so highly of Job, if you read in Ezekiel chapter 14, that it compared Job to Job's righteous, righteousness to Daniel and Noah. So Job was living a righteous kind of life. And a righteous not life is not an easy life. In Psalm chapter 34, it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. <clears throat> 
In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in 1 Peter, it says, But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And 2 Timothy says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So suffering is going to come with righteous, a righteous life. And we read that quote last time in the, the message, The Art, where Brother Branham said, you might be sick for a little while. You may have to go through something for a little while. But remember, Christ is at the end. He never said this art will set in a little whirlpool where there'll be no calm, just as calm as it can be. He never carried a flower bed of ease. He never promised things easy, but he promised grace yes. to sustain you in the time. So he never promised that life would be easy. There's plenty of promises that life is going to be hard, that you go through times where you just wonder almost if you can bear the, the suffering and the agony. And so that's if we frame it up right, if frame up our perspective, that we can see that there is really no promise that suffering will always be at a manageable level. Right. Now that's that's if we look if sometimes uh, you look at you look at situations and you just wonder how you can cope with it. It seems like it's just washing over you like a wave, and you just can't you just can't bear it. And I think sometimes. We, we've, we, we've come to look at suffering with a skewed interpretation of Scripture because <clears throat> like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 is often misquoted. If I, if I was going to read that real quick, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape Amen. that ye may be able to bear it. Amen. Now, what's that mean? Brother Brandon, he preached a sermon about this, that, that God will, if, 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 let's say if you're, if you're a drunkard, there's a way of escape out of being a drunkard, right. and that way is Christ. If you're a sinner, there's a way of escape. There's a way of escape out of the temptation. And God won't give you a temptation that there's not a way to get out of it. But this is speaking of temptation, not suffering and life, life bearing down on you so hard where it seems sometimes like you just can't bear it. There's not a promise where he won't give you so much that, so much that you just can't handle it. Because sometimes you got to turn it over to God. Many times you got to turn it over to God. I was reading this morning where Brother Brown was talking about... Um, <clears throat> He, he, he was telling his life story of how he watched his wife and little Sharon Rose die. And then it just became so unbearable till he got to that place where he reached up and grabbed the power line. But God come on the scene and raised him up. And then he said, he said, I was sitting there after that, after that happened. This is a born again Christian. He, he was sitting there in his home and he got a letter in the mail. And it was addressed to Miss Sharon Rose Branham. And he said that just pushed him over the edge. I see sometimes things in life get to where you just, you just feel like you can't handle it. You can't bear it. And that pushed him over the edge, and he grabbed his gun. He went out, I guess he was in the woods or somewhere, grabbed his gun, pulled his gun up to his head, and he said, I, I was delirious. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. Pull the trigger. And it wasn't him that saved him. It was God that saved him. See, sometimes we get to the place where we just can't deal with it anymore. And that's when you got to turn it over to God. Right. When you can't bear it anymore, you turn it over to God, and he's the one that will come on the scene and will bear it. Amen. So we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That's about temptation. And temptation is about your choices. God's not going to give you preview to, to a place where there's not a way of escape where you can't make the right choice. Right. But suffering is a different category from your choices. Suffering and life and, and thing, you know, I, I was thinking this morning about <coughs> when Esther was born. I got laid off from my job and I was watching her being born and I didn't, I was, my insurance was about to run out. And you, you feel like you actually, when you get in a place of pressure, you actually feel like that there's a weight, a literal weight on you. 
right. and you you you're thinking, you know, what what am I going to do? I, I can't I can't just run out and go get a job or something. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you, I called the recruiters and they they wouldn't even answer during that time. And I, it was around uh, uh, twenty years ago or whatever, where there, there was a market. Uh, crash and there were no jobs available and and you get to a place where you feel that weight what are you going to do and and you God brings you to those places what are you going to do you can't bear it you can't do it there's nothing within yourself so what you got to do is turn it over to God Amen. turn it over to God and let him bear your burden right. now temptation temptation is a desire or urge to do something, especially something unwise or wrong. But suffering now, this suffering is a different category. It's a state of undergoing pain or distress or hardship. And it's often suffering sometimes is unavoidable. It's just part of the human condition. It's just part of living. And now that's the story of Job that is framing up sometimes Things just happen in life that it doesn't have anything to do with whether you're righteous or unrighteous. It's just part of living or part of God just pulling the hedge back to see what you're made of, to allow things to happen to you, to mold your character. And it has nothing to do with whether you're right or wrong. It's just, it's just part of life, like, like losing your job or, or losing a loved one. Or things, things just happening that befall everybody. They just happen to everybody. It's just part of life. So there's no promise now that God won't allow overwhelming suffering. Overwhelming suffering. Now, th now think about that. In the, in the, I, I was reading through all these stories of the, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the Christian ladies um, that were martyred, that were actually there was a, a, a Christian lady in the th uh, third century A.D. that they, they grabbed her and her, she had a little woman that worked with her and they, 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 they arrested them. And this little, little woman, her name was Felicity, and she was pregnant. And they grabbed her and threw her into the, uh, the prison of the Colosseum. And she was pregnant at eight months. And, and because of, of her Christian stand, I, I'm talking about suffering now. Because suffer, you would think that God will not allow overwhelming suffering. Suffering, she was pregnant at eight months. And they grabbed her. She gave birth in prison right a month before she died in the Roman Colosseum. There's a lot of things that have happened through life. Uh, Paul getting his head chopped off and being dragged to Rome and Peter being crucified upside down and the, the saints that, that had uh, hung upside down and have salt shoved in their nose to, and torture, tortured and unimaginable torture. See, it seems like those were, those were unbearable things. But God was on the scene. <laughs> in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said, Speaking of very unbearable suffering, he said, We would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. Out of measure means it was beyond our, our tolerance. Above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. See, when you get to a place where you just can't bear it no more, Oh, that's when you put all your trust in God. When you maybe reach over to the side of your bed and your loved one's not there anymore, or you 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 wish that maybe you could do things over again, and, and you just can't bear it no more. And it seems like the waves of suffering are just crashing down over you. Put it put it in God's hands. Turn to Him and say, God, I need you to help me, and He'll help you like like He helped Brother Branham when he stopped that bullet, stop the gun from firing. He helped him when, it, when he reached up and grabbed the power line, and it was beyond anything that he could do. So Paul said that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, and whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Yes. Psalm 34, like we just read, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. In Psalm chapter 50 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. In Philippians chapter 4 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Amen. Now see, there's when you're framing it up the right way. You're not trusting in your own ability. You're not trusting in your own self. But you're trusting in the God that... <laughs> 
He's the one that makes a way. He's the one that rose on Easter Sunday, and he's the one that gives us strength in the time of adversity. And there will be times of adversities. Yes. You think about all these stories that are laid out in the scripture of Christians and believers that faced tremendous adversities, like Job that lost everything, and Joseph that was thrown into prison by his own brothers, and Daniel that got thrown in the lion's den, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and John the Baptist thrown into prison, and then cut his head, they cut his head off, and Stephen that was stoned. Those all th seem like unbearable suffering to be stoned to be rocks thrown at you until your head's cracked open and you're laying there in the street looking up at the sun as your life leaves you. Paul was beat, imprisoned, shipwrecked, constant danger. Peter was crucified upside down. All the early Christian martyrs that were crucified in Roman arenas. Polycarp that was burned at the stake. Joan of Arc, William Tyndale, John Bunyan thrown into prison for 12 years for preaching without being sanctioned by the church, and on and on. So Christian scripture emphasizes that God's, God's going to be there with us during suffering. Amen. But it doesn't promise that our suffering is always going to be manageable by our own abilities. That's right. God might allow life to bring us to our knees so that we can learn to trust him. Right. Amen. You know, that's, I think that's when our character is really shaped. When it's really shaped when you're maybe maybe curled up in the shower in the morning in an agony because there's mental problems and mental battle. That's what most of the job is about, the mental problems. The first, the first chapter is everything stripped away. The second chapter is his, he, he doesn't have his health anymore. And then the following chapter is just mental anguish and battles and things. And that's when that's when in that in that in life, the crucible of life when your character really begins to be shaped. And God allows us to go through these things sometimes to validate and effectively mold our character, to validate our character. You go through a place in life where you, you, you get tested and it validates that you really have the goods. It validates that you really trust God. And Brother Brown would compare that to a, uh, <clears throat> he'd call it a cupola. In, in one place, he said there's a, a cupola is like this big giant furnace thing where they would make they would make a, a fashion something out of a, you know metal, and and if they could get all the ingredients right, and, and like if they're making a bale, they'd get have this big fa uh, this big cupola where they're molding something in it, and they're molding a, a in the story of Brother Random told a bale. And if they could get all the ingredients right and get the fire real nice and hot when they pull that, that, uh, the bale out of the cupola, then it would ring right. And see, that's what our life is. Sometimes the things that we go through in life where the fire gets real hot and if all the ingredients are just right after it's tested, after it gets pulled out of that cupola, the big cupola, and then they strike it and it'll ring just right. Now, that's what we want. We want to be pulled out of the fire, and God can test us. And, and if you ring right, you'll do like Job, and you'll say, no, Lord, no matter what happens, I'm still trusting him. You're not trusting him to get something. You're not trusting him to get a lot of money. You're not trusting him to get a lot of wealth or have a lot of popularity. popularity. No matter what happens in life, you're still going to trust him. If the Lord takes everything away from me, I'm going to trust him no matter what. Amen. Now, there is a real mature Christian. And we have seen his star. Uh, Brother Brown said, did you ever see them when they were fixing to mold a bell? Some famous bell for a church chime or something that had to give a certain ding. You see, if you're ringing a chime, it takes a certain range for each bell, and it takes certain materials to go in there. So much brass, so much steel, and so much of other ores to go into this bell. If it's just straight brass, it won't ring right. Amen. It's right. got to have all kinds of materials thrown into it to make it ring the right kind of a tone. And the man who has put the mold up and set the mold, he knows exactly what it takes to go in that cupola, what it takes to go into that metal to make that bell ring that tone. God is our great cupola. God is, he is the great refiner's furnace. 
that where he has to put these things upon us and trials and persecutions and things to mold it together to make our testimony ring for a certain time and a certain note that he wants to ring out in a certain day. So you got to go through the fire. You got to where people mock you and make fun of the way that you're living and and, 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 and go through all the, the, the hall of critics because look, a suffering is necessary for your character development. What does it do? It builds, it builds resilience. So if somebody says something, uh, somebody says something about the way that you're living and the way maybe it'll affect you when you're a young Christian, but later on, you're not, you're not looking for validation from somebody else. You can stand on your own two feet. And you can know, like, like Job said, I, I know my Redeemer liveth. Yes, amen. You don't need somebody else to tell you. You know, it's, and it builds resilience as you go through the fire. It, 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 it fosters independence because you, you're standing on your own. You, you got to be independent. You got to be able to stand on your own two feet. You, it helps you to understand consequences. And, and it helps you to cultivate empathy. Because how can you really feel for somebody if you've never gone through trials and never, never gone through something? You know, you, 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 you have back trouble. You can feel for somebody that has, has back trouble. You, you have migraines. You can feel for somebody that's got migraines. You ever been laid off before? You can feel for somebody that's been laid off. You lose a spouse or lose a loved one or something. You can feel for somebody that's going through that. And then you can really, you can minister and help to somebody. And what does it do? So hard times actually builds your self-esteem too. It, it helps you. It helps you look at things differently, because you you get you get crushed and you get you get molded down to where you're trusting in God, and then you realize you start to realize that you're genuine. Yes, sir. And you start to appreciate positive experiences. You start to appreciate appreciate life because you're looking at things differently hard times and trials and tribulations are necessary for character development <clears throat> that's one thing to keep in mind as we're raising our children as we're about to close I'll, I'll stop on this note but you know sometimes we want to prevent our children from from in from hard times and from suffering and things but that's actually what if we'll take a step back and allow sometimes allow things to happen Allow them to go through a little rough spot. I, I was I was watching uh, Zoe when she she had to she uh, she got called to uh, uh, this this place where that does teaches violin students. They they didn't have a piano teacher, so she got called to play the piano for the of uh, this little class. And boy, she was so nervous. She didn't think that she could do it. And you know she was real nervous about doing that. And you know once it's all done, then you it builds you. Now she's got a little bit more confidence. But going into it, you know, you I don't know, I don't think I can do it, and and you you stress, she's stressing and practicing a little bit more, and see what where would we be without those those suffer those suffering times where you're you're maybe you're staying awake the night before, worrying about it and and wondering how it's going to turn out, but it actually molds your character, and what see what we do sometimes as parents is we try to limit those things, but that's that's not what God did with Job, and that's not. That's not how you're going to be, how you're really going to grow to uh, a mature individual. And I'm over time, so we'll stop there. But God allows these things to happen to us Amen. for our good. God bless you. Amen.